moving the camera closer. I want you 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 close today. I just, you know, I think that there's a level of wanting to huddle, to circle. I know we were talking about this as like a, a huddle puddle <laughs> in one of my posts. And that really struck me as like, you know, really coming together as healers, as rebel unicorns, spiritual entrepreneurs, witches, and reclaiming this ability to just be with each other in our sadness or in our grief and in our emotions and our anger and whatever it is that we are feeling as a community, as a collective, as without trying to fix each other, without trying to make it wrong, but this deep, deep honoring of, of our emotions. And it's interesting because I went for a hike and I was listening to this Mayan man talking about grief and he was talking about that very thing is that when somebody was sad that they would just let the sadness be and the sadness you know you would you would see them in the street if they're crying out or pulling out their hair and falling on the ground and you know they would call the professional weeper in the village and this person they would pay this person they wouldn't necessarily pay this person in money but they would pay this person in and taking care of them, making sure that they had food for life or, you know what I mean? And, and they would take this sad person and they would invite the tears up, call the tears forward, call the release, and they would, you know, tell the story. And that had me thinking, even before I listened to that, that there's a level of storytelling that I think that we, we as a community can bring back. I was, I was thinking about this because I've been tying so much into my memories of Avalon and with these pelvic massages that I'm having and, you know, remembering spirit being like, we gave you your name. Your name is Avalon. Remember that in, in, you know, September, 2019, but you've been too afraid to claim your name that we gave to you. And I was like, you're right. I have been, I have been afraid to claim that name. Avalon, Avalon Starlight. And, and so there's this like sweetness to remembering that within us, we carry, we carry, you know, this trauma, this trauma of grief that was unprocessed through our ancestors. It's like we inherited this, this level of grief passed down from generations to generations. And more so because I believe that, you know, as witches, as healers, as spiritual entrepreneurs, we had to hide our grief. We had to hide our grief. You know, we were told that grief is something that you, you don't express or that you don't share or you don't allow others to, to see. It's a burden. It's a weight. It is too heavy. And so we stopped allowing ourselves to feel the true sensations of grief and it's been it's been interesting because i have been in grief for the last week and a half right this this and in this video i was listening to there was this beautiful comment that grief is is like the same as as praise and if you are grieving something you are praising it because you are sad it is gone and if you can tap into the grief of that feeling then you can that's you you celebrating it you're celebrating it you know and i wanted to come in and talk about this ancestral inheritance in in multiple forms and in multiple ways because i think that we're all holding a little bit of grief of our ancestors these traumas that have been passed down from generation to generation to generation and and we, we don't really know how to express them or allow ourselves to feel through them. You know, I remember, you know, I came from a very poor family. You know, we, we lived in subsidized housing. My mom did her absolute best and she worked really hard until she didn't, until she got unwell mentally. 
But I remember that, you know, money, those with money were different. They were, they were wrong somehow. We weren't like them. They were, you know, separate from us. And we lived in a very, like, you, you, you needed to be content with what you had. You had to, like, you didn't burden anybody with your financial distress. You know, if you're wearing secondhand clothes, if you're getting your clothes from Bargain Heralds in Byway, like you are, you're celebrating that because if you ask anyone for anything, you're begging. And that was lower than where we were, this begging, this begging, you know, that sense of like, we're not so low that we beg. We have enough to get by and you should be really happy with that. Like if we have what we have, if we don't have anything that's really great, we had one shopping trip a year to really go to back to school clothing. And this was like this thing. And then the rest we got from other people. It wore a lot of my sister's clothes. Money was bad, you know? And I think we, we, there's, there's some people who have this story that I wanted to share. And I mean, I remember growing into high school and not connecting with anything that was occurring in my high school. Like I'm not a lectured learner. I'm not somebody who can sit there and be told what to do. Maybe that's why I understand rebel unicorns is, is here, right? I don't, don't tell me what to do and don't tell me how to learn. And don't tell me this man's per like version of this is what I need to hear. And I fucking hated walking down the hallway and feeling these heavinesses of these emotions, you know, that the, the weight I was already carrying of my own ancestral history being passed down to me. And now I'm feeling all of these, this weight of these other kids and what they're going through in their lives and with no buddy to support me in understanding how sensitive, you know, my, my genealogy is, my ancestry is, I, I didn't know what to do with all those emotions. I really didn't. I just thought everybody hated me. Like, and, and in this place of fear, of never being open enough to ask the simple question, like, hey, are you pissed off at me? Or, hey, I get the sensation you don't like me. Is that true? Like, that, that level of insecurity, of hiding, of not wanting to be seen, of fear. You know, by the time, like, my nanny, my grandmother never worked. Like she never worked. She, she took care of the house. She took care of the kids. She took care of my mom. She took care. I didn't witness Nanny working. She worked the house. She worked the family, you know? My sister couldn't work. She would try jobs, but the heaviness, the weight of this ancestral trauma, this, this weight of this grief that has been passed down from generation to generation. Like my nanny lost both of her husbands, both of them. And I've never seen her weep. I've never seen her cry that like, how, why, why cry? Why, why has this happened to me cry? Never, gotta keep it together, you know? You gotta keep it together. And so my sister's carrying this grief. Well, I'm carrying this grief. My mom's carrying this grief, this grief that's been passed down all these years, all this stuff and this like heaviness within our bodies. You know, my sister never really held a job, my nanny. By the time I was in my 20s, my mom stopped working. My mom, again, the weight of carrying so much just was too much for her to handle. And I'm seeing it now so differently as this unprocessed heaviness. And so, by the time I'm in my, my mid-twenties, you guys, I've left my school. I don't know who I am. I'm a mom. I've got a five-year-old kid by the time I'm 25. I have no female role model in my life that is showing me the importance of feeling who they are of experiencing what it's like to be in this body or tapped in or tuned into the value of our emotions. My family numbed, 
right? Me whether it's medication, whether it's drugs, whether it's alcohol. And I, I mean, there's nothing wrong with this. I don't think that it's fair to say that people who are numbing or using medication or alcohol, it's like these things have value because they, they, they subdue or they pause or they hold off this wave of experiencing this trauma that we're carrying. And I, I mean, I have, I used a lot. I mean, I was a functioning alcoholic for a chunk of my time. Like I was drinking a bottle of wine a day, a day. And I'm, I'm like, this isn't even that long ago. This is after I started writing my books. This is after, you know, I downloaded, I could read chakras. There was a point in my life where it was still too much. These emotions, these feelings, these these traumas, this heaviness, this weight. The weight of the experiences of those who have come before us. You know, and I remember thinking at some point how, how annoying it would be if I cried right? Like how annoying is it? Like, ooh, you know, like I don't want people to know I'm sad. I don't want people to see that I don't have it together. You know, when I was mothering a child with severe mental illness and every day was a behavior, every day I would wake up, every day I would wake up and know something was going to happen without fail, without fail. And I would lie in my bed and I would think, do I even want to get up today? Do I want to get out of bed because something's going to happen? And do I want to face what that thing is going to be today? And I would get out of bed. I would get out of bed. And I had a job that allowed me to bypass my emotions the best. And I'm so grateful that I found this job. I did this YMCA, you know, job thing where you get to like go and sit down and they script out what your job perfect job would be for you and it was working as a personal trainer or being in a fitness field and I got myself into the YMCA and it was it was gold to me it was gold it was the most it was so important at that time for me to be in the energy of people who were wanting to change their lives right that were showing up to do some form of betterment because I truly believe that by energetically choosing that it offered me a different view of the heaviness, right? It, it offered me uh, the view of positivity, but it, it also helped me hide. It also allowed me to hide really, really well because I would show up and you all know this Tamara. You know her really well. Hey, everybody. <laughs> like, oh my goodness, I'm so excited to see you. Let's do this thing. And, uh, uh, uh. and I was really good. And I am really good. I'm really good at being a bundle of love and a bundle of light and a bundle of joy because th that is who I am. And I'm also this depth, this heaviness, this grief of my, of my lineage, right? And... And there have been times in my life that the poverty was so big, so big, and I was too afraid to ask for help, you know, and I wanted everybody to think I had it together. And now I'm in my, you know, early 30s at this point and not knowing where to go to seek support, not having money coming in, having $40 to my name. $40 to my name to feed myself and my two kids for a week. You know, how do you, how do you do that? Right? Like, how do you like, but I would figure it out, you know, like we need bread, we need the eggs, some chicken that will spread things out. You know, like I, I can, I can do this, you know, a couple boxes of KD, you can make $40 go pretty far. But I didn't know, I didn't know any different because this is what I was experiencing. This is what I witnessed. This is what, 
was passed down to me was this level of we don't have enough and we don't ask for help. We don't ask for help because that's begging. And we are, that is one step below where we are. So you don't do that. And yet, you guys, and yet, there was this little niggle, you know? There was this, this thought, this, I don't know how to explain it. There was like this, this feeling within me that there was also something different. And I would live in this polarity, right? This polarity of like, I, my reality was really impoverished in some way. I mean, I felt love. I knew that my family loved me. I knew that, you know, I had these beautiful kids. I had, you know, a house. I mean, I bought my first house when I was 23. I was always in this space of owning things and having things. And like, I had a roof over my head and there was some gratitude for that, but there was also this, this deeper sense of understanding that there was more, there was more. And I would connect with it every once in a while. Like, there were many years and maybe you can relate to this that i would buy these books these books on how to make money i i would buy these books on like having a business online and what that would look like and how would i have it and you know and i never read them <laughs> i just put them on the shelf i'd be like this seems like a good no no i'm gonna put that one on the shelf i'm not ready for it and so i was like accumulating this library of like things this library of things and eventually i would get to eventually i would be like oh my god i have so many books about this because there was a part of me that understood that there was a moreness to what i was experiencing almost like a flip side to the coin of this poverty and this belief system and this generational <sighs> lack is not the right word because i don't I don't judge my family and I don't think that their experience here has been wrong in any way. I'm not devaluing this lineage that I have because I'm grateful that I've learned so much through my experiences and of witnessing my family. And I'm, I get to see the polarity and the duality every day, every day with my family. Now I grew up in this, city called St. Catharines and my whole family lives in one side of it. Like you have your north side and your south side and you know, all these things. And my, my family stays in the north side. They don't travel, they don't leave. It's a very small circle. And there's these bridges, Ontario Street Bridge, Lake Street Bridge, <laughs> like these little bridges. And I moved to the first street almost on the other side of the bridge. It was the second house I bought and it was like this how could you do that? How could you leave the North End? Now we will never see you. Now we will, you know, you've gone so far because it's just this, this little view of the world. I felt really proud of myself by moving to the South End. Even though it was one street over, I was like, you are such a big girl now. You have moved to a different part of the city, not far outside of this part of the city, but you did it, you know? And then I slowly moved to the outskirts of the city. And then it moved cross country. It was like these little steps that I was taking along this way to just untangle, untangle these, these two sides of the same coin that we carry within us, you guys. And this is what I want to, to bring forth, right? Like there are these things that we have that our families have learned and experienced and as witches, especially, and as healers and as spiritual connectors you know it goes beyond what we even witness in our realities right like as as women as magicians as, as healers if those are here that are you know male born this is true for you too if you are in the connection to something more so i always knew there was this 
this alternate choice, this alternate reality, reality. And I didn't know quite how to connect with it, right? Like, it's like, how do you go from where we experience? Like, I, I don't have mom, sister, grandmother who work. My dad isn't here. He told me very young that if I didn't have an education that I was doomed, right? Because he was the only one who got it his degree and his family and like you know what I mean so you have all these beliefs and you have all of this external stuff that says like you're fucked you're screwed like you might as well just get used to this being your reality but you know it's not there's something else and this is the the piece that I think is the profound connecting piece is that our lineage doesn't just pass down the heaviness and the grief and the, and the traumas, but they also share these stories and these knowings and these inklings and these other versions of these tales of heroicism and bravery and courage and depth and love. And they are within us as well. Right, because there, that knowing that I knew that there was something different available to me, it was coming from somewhere. It was connecting to the divine in some way. My family is not religious. I mean, I'm baptized and confirmed Anglican, but like if you ask me what I did in church, I went to Sunday school and colored. I heard nothing about what they were saying about God. I went to church on and off till I was 13. I was never listening. I was always in some form of creativity, internalizing in my own self, not engaging with an outside world, not making friends, not doing anything weird one. If you relate to that, right? Always just outside the circle. Found my joy in high school by being on stage because then I could be somebody else. I could be something else. I could be, which served me served me well because then i can tap into being something else and interesting because now in business right the more true you are the more it makes sense and you're just like shit fuck i've been every other version of myself who's that deeper version of me oh i gotta get to know myself a little bit more and that's the nectar that's the truth that's the the connecting in this is like when i wrote my kid is driving me crazy, a mom's survival guide for living with a child with mental illness. You know, it was interesting because I had witnessed depression my whole life. I had witnessed, you know, mental illness. And when Ethan and I had to take a break from each other because it was toxic. And there was this claiming in that moment, you guys, this claiming, and I will remember this day for the rest of my life, that this, this understanding that the version of life that we are experiencing, it's still ours. Like, like I didn't have to be something I wasn't. I didn't have to try and pretend anymore. I didn't have to do things right or be the perfect mom or do this. I could see that this was unhealthy. I could, I could acknowledge that and know deep down inside of me that it had to stop. It had to stop for the greater good of all parties involved. But it caused me to go into my own version of depression, right? And then that grief, because grief is coming back to that, allows us to like crack into parts of ourselves. Like it's almost like the, the, the break is where we see more. Because we all have this grief we're carrying and we're not allowing it to be part of the experience of the creation. And it was in that grief, that depression, that I could start to hear, start to feel feel. Feeling was very big for me because I never wanted to hurt anyone and I never wanted to upset the boat and I never, I was the strong one. I kept everything together. I was the glue for the family. Everyone else could be sad. I would stay good for everybody else. Do you relate? Maybe you relate. Maybe you don't. I could fix everybody. But in that moment, I couldn't fix myself. I felt like a million shattered pieces all over and that's when I really started to connect again to spirit that's when a deeper 
that deeper knowing that I would felt but hadn't quite reconnected to, that's when it, I started to hear it again. I wasn't just seeing and feeling and experiencing this unfelt trauma because when I cracked open, the trauma was like, oh, okay, here you are. Look at all this genealogy and this, this heaviness and this ancestral stuff that you're feeling. Like, look at this. This isn't just yours. This is too much for just one human to carry. This is, this is bigger than that. And it was scary and it was nurturing and it was loving and it was overwhelming. You know, I went through a massive spiritual awakening. And when I say massive, because it was hard and it was fast at that point. Once I realized that I was receiving information from spirit, A, I made the therapy appointment because my family suffers from mental illness. And I was like, am I crazy? I'm hearing voices. I'm feeling things. I'm like doing all this stuff. I'm seeing snowflakes hit my windshield. So crystal clear. I could see every single like nuance of it. The leaves on the trees, man, they were spectacular. It was like jewels everywhere I looked. So my brain was aching. I was like, what the fuck is happening to me? <laughs> is this normal? Am I going crazy? Like there's nobody who teaches us that these experiences are profound and big and like magical, but also what the fuck do I do with them? What do I do with this? Where do I go? Who do I talk to? about this experience. So I went to my counselor that I've been seeing forever because somehow, again, this knowing that I needed to have people in place. I've been speaking to this woman for so long, 10 years, 10 years. And she was like, now it's time, time for what? You to come to my course in miracles. I'm like, who are you? And why are you telling me this now? And you know, all of a sudden, again, I'm unlocking all of a sudden by this grief, by this cracking open, my reality is beginning to change. Right. I'm starting now to receive the answers and the mentors and these catalytic experiences to activate the story and my lineage of this deeper knowing of my ancestry. Right. And again, I'm not, I'm not realizing I haven't downloaded. I could read chakra chakras yet. I'm just receiving spirits messages. I'm just hearing voices in my head and they're just speaking to me and I'm doing what they're saying. They're like, and it's random. It's my voice, but it's coming from behind me. So it sounds like somebody speaking from behind me when I hear messages, just so you guys maybe are experiencing or knowing that, that feeling or that sensation. You know, you think that when we hear spirit, it's going to be like, I am God, or I am your angel. So it's going to be like, for me, that's not what it is. Spirit comes to me through my own hearing, through my own voice. And there became a relationship building, right? We started to like learn each other and communicate with each other. And they would give me little things to do, create this, do this. And it was always outside my comfort zone. It was always something that I did not would not normally do for myself, you know? Which ultimately led to me writing. My kid is driving me crazy because they're like, you need to write a book and this is what you're gonna do. Contact Hay House. And I'm like, I don't know what the fuck you're telling me to do. Like I would go for a walk and like literally spirit would be and if you've ever received them, they can be, if they have a path for you. And I think this is where numbing comes in because sometimes it can be really intense can be intense. But I remember being so petrified to write my first book, you guys, because <laughs> I was afraid that if I wrote my first book, that people would stop talking to me. Friends would stop talking to me. My family would stop talking to me. And who was I without that, like this identity? That was all I knew. Right. I fixed people. I was the glue. I was the strong one. I was like all of these identities. I was like the caregiver. I was, and if I wrote this book, it might wipe that out. And I was scared shitless and I was still living in my poverty mindset. I was still living in witnessing that things were not available to me. Money was not available to me. I didn't have the money to write this book. The money didn't just magically appear in my account. I had creditors fucking calling me at that time, right? 
And yet I was like, I have to do this. There's got to be, there's a knowing. There's a knowing inside of me that there is something different available to me. And without realizing what I was doing, I started to tap into not seeing what wasn't there, but realizing that if I really wanted something, that it would absolutely be there, that I could make anything happen. Because I'd got this like, almost like I was getting more confident with whatever spirit was telling me to do, because I used to say that I never finished anything I started. And so spirit would give me these activities and I would finish them. And then it was gaining, I was gaining confidence in myself, right? Like in my capacity and my awareness of me, you know, I was starting to trust myself. I was starting to believe myself, which is very third eye, right? Trust in God, the spirit, universe, trusting others and trusting in yourself. And I was building this trust with myself. I was following through with what I was wanting to do. And so when spirit was like, write a book and I was like, I don't have the money to write a book. I didn't, I didn't question about where the money wasn't. I started to look for where the money was. And, you know, I was very unconscious about what I was doing, but I was doing it. You know, I would contact the banks. I would reach out to people. I would do all these things. And a friend offered me her credit card for that one. And I, I remembered to the day that I was like, is this wrong? Are you allowed to do this? Well, I have to pay this back. Do I believe that I could pay this back? Like, this was a very catalytic moment for me, you guys. And I remember, I remember in every ounce of my being thinking, of course, I'm going to be able to pay this back. Of course, this is going to be the most profound experience. I know that writing a book is within me. Spirit told me so. And that this book is going to be something. It's going to do something. It's going to change something. I had no proof of that, by the way. And for the year before that, I'd been joining programs and wasn't receiving the proof. I'd probably spent about 8000 in 2016. And it wasn't, it wasn't changing anything. I wasn't changing. I wasn't looking within. I wasn't doing the part that actually begins to release, release the the heaviness and the grief and the traumas. I still was thinking I could figure it out out here. You know, I could just get the right thing in. <laughs> I could change it from a very external source. It didn't work. <laughs> so this book writing thing was A, the most money I'd ever spent. I was super petrified that people were going to judge me that I spent this money on a, on a program. I started to validate it and make it right. Like, you know, like I didn't go to university. This is how I'm spending my money on university. And I felt like if I could justify it that way, right, that people would make sense. I'm learning how to write a book. That's like getting an education. It didn't matter what I was saying. What mattered was I knew that I was listening to a guidance that was, was that telling me this relationship that I'd built this is really powerful for you to do. You need to do this. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. I love my first book. I'm so grateful to my kid is driving me crazy. It healed my relationship with Ethan in a really big way, asking his permission. And my fear of speaking my truth because it would piss people off came fucking true right? I did speak my truth. And I lost friends and I lost some family. I'm never going to not tell you the truth, but those were really relationships that had reached their peak, that had reached their pinnacle, that were like kind of done anyway. And because we have a life cycle, right? Everything has an ending and a beginning and, and everything's in these beautiful cycles, which is part of what I want to get to here. These beautiful cycles. And so my throat activated and my root chakra changed because I became really connected with the fact that 
I could create my own community. I could create something that maybe I'm not experiencing or witnessing in my, my birth family, my family of origin, but that, that we have the capacity to, to find people who actually do understand us and celebrate us and have, you know, the same vibrational frequency as us, which I wouldn't have said that language in 2017, by the way, I wasn't there yet. <laughs> it's been a process, right? And so I wrote this book and I'm writing this book and it's killing me. Like it draws it. Like anyone who is an author knows you have to live through your book. You have to call up the stuff that you're like, I don't want to talk about this anymore. Like I'm done. I healed it. I don't want to go through it again. And you're writing your book and it's all up in this way. And you're just like disturbing all of the energies and you, and you're like feeling it. And this was even better because now, now that grief was even more there, right? And I could feel it was tangible and it was heavy and it was all these emotions. And there was no other way for me to write a book except to go through them, like to be willing to witness them, to, to see them and not judge them. But these are my emotions. Like they were my experiences. <laughs> these are my, this is my story that I get to like pass down, which ties to the witchery, right? This, these books have become my book of shadows, if you will. Inside of the book that I was writing, I was writing my spells. I was writing what I did to solve these problems into a paper that could be passed down from person to person to person to person to person to person. Whoever needed it would find the spell book and inside the spells would be there. The rituals would be there. And it was in this like releasing and feeling and moving of energy through the chakras that boom, boom, just like that, boom walking out my bathroom. You can read chakras. What the fuck are you saying? Spirit, <laughs> what are you saying? You can read chakras. Cray cray. Wrong human up in here. This girl does not know what a chakra is. I don't know what to do to read them. Like you need to, you need to back off, yo. Go on your merry way. But they're like, no, no, no. And I mean, we had a pretty strong relationship there. And I just want to, to, to tell you this, my spirit conversation ebbs and flows. It ebbs and flows. Spirit isn't always speaking to me this firmly. They're not always guiding me. They're not always telling me what to do very distinctly. Sometimes they are. This was just a season in my life where spirit wanted to get me in track. It wanted to get me back to understanding this deeper knowing, this purpose, this, this creation story within me and in you, we all have one, we all have one. And so they were very loud at that time. And at this point, the relationship was strong enough. I was like, fine, I'll read some chakras. Don't know, I'll just throw this up on Facebook. People will say, yes, what the fuck am I gonna do with this information? I'm still gonna hide on my Facebook Messenger phone. I'm gonna use my phone on this Facebook Messenger because we start somewhere, we start somewhere. My story is I started petrified out of my wit's end. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> Who am I to read fucking chakras? I'm just like this white privileged girl in North End St. Catharines at the time who was told I could read chakras. Okay, anyone, anyone want to let me do this thing with you? And people said yes, because there's a greater force here at play, right? This is like a, a rekindling of a deeper knowing. And this gift that I received is not like spirit gave it to me. It was already in me. This is my inheritance from my witchery, from my witch's past, from my great, 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 grandmother, right? And so all that's happening here is this reactivation, this amplification of the story, the lineage. So it comes through in this message from spirit, but it's already within me. It's a gift given all along it's my inheritance and so i start practicing i start practicing 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 and it's powerful and it's potent and it's true and i think i'm fucking even weirder now y'all 
Ooh, you know, now I'm going to tell people I read energy and chakras and <laughs> all right, let's do this. Let's do this. Like I, what, what can I do at this point? Except be all in, all in. And it keeps getting easier and better and stronger and more potent in this. And it leads to book number two, which again is yet again, another book of shadows. Right? These are the stories that tell you what's happening in your chakras. And every time I'm leaning into this and into service of this inheritance that's been passed down from generations, wealth is coming to me. Wealth is coming to me. I don't have to work hard for it. I don't have to like strive for it. I don't have to like go after it. I have to just show up in this knowing that this is what I was put on this earth to do. This is my medicine. This is my nectar. This is my truth. This is my reactivation story. And I'm bringing this up because I think that this is a powerful thing because you guys are going to hear me talking about wealth a lot coming forward, you know, and being our wealthy witches. Um, and I wanted to give the story of why, why am I talking about wealthy witches and why am I sharing, you know, that I'm a spiritual wealth and business coach. It's because we have within us this lineage, right? I, I can feel it so clearly now, you know, we were so revered. We were so revered in, in previous iterations before, you know, the, the healer, healer genocide, before patriarchy, before, you know, the trauma that we feel, the heaviness and the grief that is important. It's part of our story. We were the most cared for, just like in this Mayan video that I was listening to on YouTube about the, the woman who, who is you know, the weeper, the professional weeper who, who teaches, who comes in and helps you pull this grief out when it wants to be in, you know, taken care of, never wanting for nothing, never wanting for nothing, always having everything that was required or needed or more so, more so revered. Just feel that word. You know, and think, you know, I, I connect so deeply with my lineage of Avalon, right? And Avalon was taken care of, right? Money was always sent to Avalon for the priestesses. Women were spent, sent to Avalon to learn how to connect with the cycles, with the earth, with their bodies. And so really what I think is, is so important here as we step forward in our lineage of wealthy witches is that we are tapping back into this, into our bodies, into the vibrational frequency of who we are. This is not coming from outside of us. Well, this is already in you. This is already in you. This is the inheritance that's been passed down. This is your lineage, you know? And yeah, 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 yeah. It comes with understanding that there is a deeper, sense of feeling than you may have ever experienced in your life, <laughs> the emotions, this depth of emotions, but like, thank fucking God, thank fucking God. I don't think I really truly appreciated the bliss or the joy, or the happiness that I was doing until I could feel the, the grief and the sadness and, and these heavier emotions. You know, and I'm excited, I'm excited, I'm excited to support even more. Because the more work I learn about the cycles of the moon and the body and the rhythms and these knowings and these truths and this connection to the power of who we were, of course, wealth is even easier, you know, 2020 where there's a lot that's bringing up. We're cracking more open, more money flows in. Right? My business was the best it's ever been. 
you know, I'd almost doubled my revenue to $600,000 in 2020. But this is wealth that is available simply by honoring our stories, honoring these truths, honoring these knowings that you have, right? So for those who haven't been in Rebel Unicorns long, this is a little bit about me and the stories, which are all found in my books as well, because they hold the spells and rituals that I was pouring out of me as I was stepping further and further into the activation of the knowing, of the truth, of the stardust that we were born with. Mm, stardust. Stardust. Oh, I love that. Because it's true. It's true. You can feel it. There's like a, that's that niggle. That's that niggle, right? Like that knowing. Mm, because history is everywhere. You know, this oneness, this connectedness is everywhere. And I, I want to invite you guys. I want you to invite you guys to go deeper into these two parts, right? Into your body, into the ancestral traumas. Yeah, I want you to feel them. I want you to know that they're there. I want you to connect deeply to your history and your body. And I also want you to know your, your deeper truth, the seed of your knowing, your passion, your stardust, your light, your essence, which is also part of your lineage, also been passed down for generations and generations and generations to generations. And then when you activate and amplify that piece, regardless of what your story is, that's where everything is possible. That's where, you know, everything becomes easier because you're not trying to solve something or figure something out. You're, you're learning to be in the truth of yourself and your gift and your starlight and your stardust and all this magic, which potently I would love to support you in because I think 2020 is going, 2021 is, 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 one of the most profound years of, of activation and of opening and of choosing this inheritance and this birthright. I like inheritance so much more than birthright. I'm going to make a video about that. Because birthright's like, oh, you were born with it. No, you weren't. You had it inside you for generations. It's there. You're just activating it. You're just tapping into what's available to you right now. And you might feel this heaviness of 2020 coming to an end. There's a great death happening, right? The seven year cycle of the genocide is now actually ending, right? We're coming into a new seven year cycle. We're coming into the age of Aquarius, like, which is a whole other Facebook live. As we move through the signs in the astrological signs, I mean, that takes like up to like 3000 years to move out of a sign astrologically and we're in the age of Aquarius. There's these newnesses, these, these endings, these cycles are ending at the end of 2020. There's so much to be released and let go because, because this deeper ancestral knowing is ready to come forth. I want to do it with you. I want to bring your awareness back into your being, into your body, into your knowing, amplify and activating your service, your impact, the truth of being a healer, which spiritual entrepreneur, and that it's, it's so much bigger than you know, and safer than you could ever understand and easier. And that Wealth is a beautiful piece of this. So if you're ready for that, like if I'm not scaring you too much, because it's a lot to think about, let's do this. Let's do this. You and me.
I love you all. It's been a very quiet chat. So if you've made it through the end of this story with me, the tale of Tamara, who became Avalon, and claimed even more of that deeper knowing, thank you. I look forward to going even deeper with you. Thank you.